Okay. Let's go. Are we we ready? We're now, we're now live for pre-show banter or the actual show. You're in charge. I think I think some pre-show banter is in order because you know I need to loosen up before <laughs> before I do the show. Uh, this is gonna be good, Trey. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I got my props ready. I do. My my props are in my lap, um, but I'm gonna take them out of my lap because they're so heavy. I've got this one <laughs> right on my crotch. Uh, it's too much. Uh, but look at the difference in these things. Well, I'm, look, I'm moving these. This is what well, we're talking about today, by the way, people tuning into the pre-show. The difference between this and this. And this and that, right there. And right. There's, an, there's a D3 with a 7200, and this is a Lumix GH3 with a 35 to 100, which is the equivalent focal length of this guy. So, look at that. Man, there's not even room on my desk for this. Okay, i got to move stuff around. you got to plan ahead when you set down a DSLR. <laughs> what do you have <laughs> on that camera? It looks like a... Like some kind of harness. What is that? <laughs> well, this doubles. I put this on my horse and on my my DSLR. It, it does double duty. <laughs> it's like the Lone Ranger yeah. and Tonto over there. Look at it's that. It's also handy for late night Saturday night parties. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, that's how you yeah. guys roll in New Zealand, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know what this is? This isn't even available. This is a limited edition uh, stuck in custom strap, and I'm not even hawking it. It's not for sale because it's sold out. And I don't oh. think we'll ever make any more. We sold them out. You should you should auction that one off, Trey. There you go. That particular one. You're not going to be using it with the camera, right? So auction that one off. It it does. It feels too big for this one. I have a. This has a another smaller, more svelte leather strap, more to nice. your liking. I know you're into yes. the lighter leather play. Um, well, Fred. here's my light leather play right there. Look at that. Can you <laughs> see that strap? Look at that. All braided right. braided leather, my friend. All right. Like a, a taxi cab seat cover. <laughs> All right. Enough of this pre-show banter. Let's do this. Let's do this because I have I got a ton of questions to ask you about this this alleged switch from alleged. big alleged a uh, big wow. big giant camera bodies to smaller cameras. So uh, are you ready? You know I'm not holding back on this. No. Let's go. Okay. Let's here we go. All right, so we're we're going to record this as a this so we're, we may this is going to be inserted into an episode of, the, of this week in photo. So I'm going to sort of play that role and take it from that standpoint, even though I'm in a Trey Radcliffe hangout. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Okay, I'm here with Mr. Trey Radcliffe. He's a, a photographer that has. I don't know, maybe over the last five years or so, or more, maybe a little less, has kind of risen to the top of social media. Right now, Trey has over 11 million cumulative followers across all of his network. So an amazing footprint in terms of uh, the people that he can reach and uh, a body of work that sort of goes along with that 11 million followers. As Trey's always around the world shooting, doing stuff for Stuck and Customs. He's wearing his Google Glass now, so he's plugged <laughs> into the Googleverse. Uh, Trey, Trey's sitting in the middle of all this. So it was a pretty big deal when I got the message from Trey saying that he was... Um, actually, we spoke just before he went to China, saying that he was going to use a Sony NEX 6 as his primary camera and use a Nikon D800 as his backup camera on this important trip to China. So he's back and the verdict's in and we decided to do this interview to discuss what his findings were. So Trey, welcome. Ah, thank you. Thanks, Fred. So one minor uh, correction there. It wasn't the NEX 6, it was the NEX 7 that I took. Ah. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, both of these cameras and lenses and stuff in, in detail today. So Okay, perfect. All right, so before we kick this off, the, one of the questions that burns my mind, I talk to a lot of photographers, as you might imagine. Um, so one of the things that, um, that I want to get clear off the beginning is, did Sony pay you to use their stuff? Was Nikon paying you to use Nikon gear? You know, so let's just clear that up. Are, are you sponsored? Yeah. No, no, I'm happy to answer that. In fact, it's a very good question to ask whenever anybody comes out and says something so bombastic and <laughs> controversial as this. Right, uh, right. But no, uh, Sony has never paid me any money. Uh, they didn't give me free equipment. I paid full price for my NEX7 and my NEX6 that I just recently got. And uh, Sony never paid me. Sony never gave me free lenses. Um, however, after I wrote that first article talking about the experiment I was about to go on, uh, Sony was very nice and they did contact me 
and they even offered me, uh, you know, free cameras, free lenses, everything for life with, uh, you know, no quid pro quo, no strings attached. It was uh, very, very nice of them. I told them no. Uh, nice. I didn't do that. I'm continuing to buy all my own stuff. Now, this, this doesn't rule out any kind of like sponsorship situation in the future, which uh, may or may not happen. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, if that happens, I'll be clear about it. Uh, but I think, you know, life is too short uh, not to use the most awesome stuff and to, you know, be authentic. I think people that have been following the blog for years and years know that I just, you know, I don't, I don't go for that nonsense. And, uh, right. Uh, but your question actually speaks to a larger question, I think, about uh, like making money in photography and marketing sure. and, and what people do to make money. Yeah. Um, I don't think we'll really talk about that today. But what they should do is um, they should go watch your other thing at Media Bytes because we did an interview all about this. And I'll post it soon talking about how, uh, you know, how to make money or this kind of stuff if you're a photographer. I don't really want to talk about that today. But we should sure. go, they should go watch that other interview that we did and go, what's, what's your website for your other thing? Mediabytes.com. So yeah, it's the it's a uh, the course is essential web marketing for photographers, and you and I, you know, you're actually in that course. So yeah, definitely, yeah, they should definitely check that out. So yeah, let, but no, this is not about marketing. This is not about that. This is about the NEX versus Nikon. So okay, so we got that stuff out of the way about the uh, the sponsorship, which is really refreshing to hear because I know a lot of photographers are looking for that kind of thing. They're looking for um, the camera manufacturer to make that deal that Sony made to you so they can stop buying camera gear, wave the flag for that camera manufacturer, and, you know, regardless of his, if it's the best thing for them or not. And you're taking the opposite track. So you've, you've purchased all your gear. You've written checks or pulled out the credit card for everything that you own, right? That's right. Absolutely. That's great. Okay. So let's, let's, let's fast forward and, or rewind a little bit actually back to, uh, you know, when you were doing the, uh, the photo walk in San Francisco and we initially talked about you were about, you were about to go to China. What was the impetus behind you saying, you know, you've been shooting Nikon forever and you, at one point you just said, Hey, I'm going to switch to the NEX6. What was the, the genesis of that mind of you making that sort of decision or that point of inflection in your head about jumping over to the smaller body? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And by the way, speaking of, of questions, uh, if anyone else has questions that's watching live on Google Plus, these Hangouts have this new thing where you can ask questions live. And I don't know Dave and awesome. Fred, are, Fred are watching these. And even when yep. you play it back, you can actually just fast forward to the question that you're interested in using this interface and skip past my the, the answers you don't you don't want to hear. Uh, but for this one, uh, I think this falls into this larger question. Like, let's stop worrying about exactly Sony or Nikon or Canon or this sort of stuff, because really, of course, we know that the equipment doesn't really matter. The main question is, how can you take very interesting photos while um, carrying around a camera that's as little as possible, you know, having uh, a ton of flexibility, uh, maybe with an interchangeable lens system, having very light, small lenses, and how do you do this as cheaply as possible? Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I we do fine with the, the studio and stuck in customs and everything. It's a nice business, so we can afford whatever. Uh, but I know that a lot of people out there are on budgets, and I really I'm very sensitive to that. And also, I don't want to just spend money for the sake of spending money. So the point is, how can you get the most interesting photos with the smallest signature possible? You know, in terms of uh, uh, weight and size, and how can you do that as cheaply as possible? You know, there's uh, there's a sweet spot that you can hit. So I was very very interested in hitting this sweet spot. And what kind of changed my mind a lot is, is I have a good friend that runs CameraLabs.com named Gordon Lang. Yes, and yeah, I know Gordon. Yeah, and he he's wonderful. Uh, he's got this. Uh, he's he's got a huge uh, excitement factor uh, in his pants for these uh, uh, <laughs> for these smaller cameras. <laughs> so I thought, man, if he's really into it, because he's like super hardcore. Like, if he's really into it, maybe he's onto something. And right. so let me just, let me start, I held, I held these up in the pre-show, but that might get cut when you actually do it. Let me just hold these, these two things up. So, so I've used Nikon for like five or six years. So yep. uh, this is the D3S, okay? And this is a uh, 24 to 70 lens, 28 to 70, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the uh, Sony NEX. I mean, look at that. Now you can see the size difference. Uh, the, the weight magnitude difference is completely off the charts, but uh, you know, this is wow. huge, this is tiny, I mean, it's a, so this is a big part of it. Plus, 
this is, uh, you know, a third of the cost of this or a fourth. It's, it's so many times smaller. So anyway, uh, the reason that I wanted to go for all of this is because I thought I must be able to take just as interesting photos without carrying so much nonsense around and do it a lot cheaper. And I said, if maybe if I can, if I can figure this out and uh, really prove that it works, uh, maybe it will help other people out there uh, save money and produce very interesting photos. Because I think that's kind of what we all want to do. Yeah, and, and save their lower back as well, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so Trey, yeah. let, just dive into the mechanics of this a little bit before we dive deeper into the, the whys and the hows and all that. So the, when you look at these, you know, and this is a D3 with a 24 to 70 millimeter lens on there. So big mm -hmm. guy, right? This is a, I feel like I'm going to battle with this one. So the, the physics involved and the mechanics involved in a camera like this in, in, with a traditional DSLR versus the mechanics in a camera like this one, I'm holding up a Lumix GH3 from Panasonic and my, my OMD from Olympus right here. So why, how are you able to get the quality of images that you are able to get out of something that I can hold with two fingers like this versus something that I'm actually using a whole different muscle set with? You know, how, where, where does this, why does the technology work here versus not needing all the math and mechanics and, and gear bells and whistles that are in the bigger machine? Well, in a lot of ways, this bigger machine, these giant DSLRs, well, I got to plan ahead when picking this thing up because it moves stuff ahead. So uh, one reason that these are so giant is not because they're so awesome. It's because there's sort of this um, mechanical history to them, right? Uh, one reason they're so nice and thick is because they have this mirror inside that flips up and down. Right. Now, the argument out there, which I totally agree with, is that you don't need a mirror in your camera in order to take a good photo. Okay. Uh, this is something that a lot of diehard DSLR people really believe, that you, you need to have a big mirror in here uh, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so these cameras kind of fall into this mirrorless category. And I know we're talking to a wide spectrum of audience. Some people say, like, yes, we know all this stuff, Trey and Fred. This is quite a sophomoric conversation. But a lot of uh, beginners don't really know why is this so much smaller. It's right. because it doesn't have this Da Vinci-esque mirror inside that mechanically flips up and down to change the optics of it. Um, now, the real magic, of course, is in the, the sensor. And the sensor that's in this tiny camera versus the sensor that's in that big camera is not that different. Um, now this is happens to be, uh, or the, the the Nikon system happen to be a full frame sensor, which is nice and big. Uh, mm -hmm. This one has an APS-C sensor, which is a little bit smaller. But these sensors are also good, frankly, and they collect more than enough light. Um, this is 24 megapixels. I mean, hello, is that enough? Uh, you know, we would have killed for 24 megapixels a few years ago. Right. Um, the optics are just fine. You know, because the sensor is smaller, you don't have to have such huge lenses. Um, you know, so I'm able to get whatever I, I need. This is a, um, let me show you this lens. This actually is my favorite lens. Look how tiny mm. it is. Which um, one is it? For the NEX7. This is the 10 to 18 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. uh, because I like to shoot landscapes, right? I sort of like these epic type landscapes. That's sort of, that's sort of the thing I like to shoot. Um, I used to use on my Nikon the 14 to 24 lens, which was nice right. and wide. I love that. I have that one. So yeah. this one basically does the same thing. So I don't want to get maybe maybe I do want I'll get techie. Yeah. I'll do a quick Let's get techie. Deep do dive, it. okay? Um, so because this is a smaller sensor, an APS-C size sensor, mm -hmm. this NEX has something called a 1.5 crop, okay? Which means yep. that the the shots that you take with a lens like this that is supposedly 10 to 18 millimeter it's effectively 15 to 27 millimeter, which really is not that different than a 14 to 24 millimeter like I'm used to shooting. So now maybe I have to back up a few extra feet when I take my shot to get the 14 millimeter, but it's really not that different. So really the, the best way to answer your question is that it's all in the sensor and the lenses. The middle part with the with the mirror that flips up and down and reverses the image a few times on this way to making it to your eye, that doesn't necessarily make for a better photo. 
Right. So, so what about, so we, you talked about sensor size, so the APS-C versus the full frame of the D3S that you have there um, and the crop factor. So why, why go with the NEX or with the, with the APS-C size sensor? Why not just jump down to a micro four-thirds format and have like with my OMD, for example, or the, the Panasonic GH3 and have the wide range, of, wide range of micro four thirds lenses that are available. Why, why stick with Sony? I have no answer for that, Fred. Uh, it's a very good <laughs> question. Yes. Because, uh, <laughs> look, this, the micro four thirds system is an amazing system, and you just hit the nail on the head about one of the big advantages of the micro four thirds system over the NEX system is there's more lenses available. And I know a lot of Micro Four Thirds people that just love these cameras, like Dave here, who's helping us out. Hello, Dave. How are you? Mm-hmm. Hello. Yeah, hey, you Dave. Man. There silently. What's, going on, guys? Uh, what's your What's your favorite camera, there, Dave? GH3, baby. Right there, yeah. all the way. Boom. Boom. Yeah, he that. loves that thing. Uh, so, by the way, Dave is the producer for my you know regular show, and he's helping out. He's helping choose the questions that go up there because I I want to concentrate on the answers. So anyway, Micro Four Thirds people, they love these things. You know, it's like their little Bible they carry around and they read scriptures from it. They go crazy, you know. It's, Not it's quite really like thing. that, but. No, no, it is. You know, you Micro Four Thirds people know what I'm talking about. But anyway, to- total respect to MFT. I think it's a great system and there's great lenses. Um, this one, this sensor is a little bit bigger, so I feel like it collects more light. Um, now, for a real comparison on this, you should go look at uh, uh, Gordon Lang's camera lab because he did a he did a sensor comparison between Excellent the stuff, same too. shot between a micro four thirds um, and the uh, APS-C type system. I think he used a Canon. Um, so it was a pretty good example that shows that uh, they're pretty equal, even though there's not much sensor noise. I'd like to see another test, by the way, Gordon. As long as I got your ear, I'd like to see another test at night uh, rather than like a, a daytime shot. Because I feel like uh, for handheld shots, when I take photos of my kids at night, for example, with this, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting more light, but that may not be the case. Yeah. And to combat um, uh, one other little uh, thread of our conversation that is unanswered, mm-hmm. uh, particular to this question, is the lens choice. So right. yes, Micro Four Thirds has a lot more lenses because there's many manufacturers that make lenses for it, as opposed to Sony, who chooses to be monolithic in their uh, design of these things, which is a little bit upsetting. But even though they're monolithic, I find that I have more than enough lenses to shoot the kind of stuff that I want to shoot. So not only do they have this lens, which I think only came out a few months ago, by the way, Mm -hmm. uh, but they also have this lens, which is the 55 to 210. Mm. Um, If you remember that 1.5 crop factor, it comes out to, what is that, 87.5 to 315 millimeter. 315. I mean, this goes 315 millimeter. I mean, un, um, unbelievable. Look at That's that. Great. And what are we looking at price-wise for that versus the equivalent on a full frame? Um, I don't know. Actually, I don't know how much it cost. Yeah. It's a good yeah. question. Yeah. So more, yeah. probably. So so let's talk about size in general, right? So size matters, right, Trey? So <laughs> with... <laughs> When you're like you're you're maybe a, a different use case because you're kind of out solo running around the globe taking photos and um, you know and post processing and doing all that stuff by yourself. But for photographers, you know, you may be speaking to photographers that have clients they're working with, whether there's a bride and a groom or the creative director or something. These smaller cameras, even though they are highly capable, talk about you know is the the perception of when you walk into a room with one of these things of people saying, wow, you're a good photographer. You must be a good photographer because you have, you know, 10 pounds of stuff in your hand versus, you know, if you show up with one of these, arguably you could do similar or maybe even better work in some cases. Does it matter? Does size matter? Well, I think uh, it's best to impress people with the robustness of your portfolio rather than the robustness of your camera. Is that your um, pickup line? That's your standard pickup line. It's <laughs> no, it'll, that works in a very small niche bar. You probably know. Um, so, no. This is, uh, uh, this is actually a really good question. And I don't do any client work at all. That's sort of a, a right. line that we drew. Uh, but I have you know, great respect for people that do do client work, and that's how they generate their income. But I believe, even though I haven't gone through this process, I believe that generally you sell the client before they even see you and your camera based on your portfolio. And then so when you show up, 
and you've got something like this, frankly, most clients don't know anything about cameras and they'll just think, oh, okay, it's a camera with a nice, decent sized lens on it. They'll think, oh, that looks like a camera. You know, not only side by, we're the only ones that obsess about the size of this versus the size of this. Yeah. If you just show up on, on site with something like this, I'll go like, oh, there's a photographer and he's holding a camera. Yes, that looks mm -hmm. like the cameras that I watch on CSI with the blacked out top. Um, yeah. You know, they'll, they'll say like, right. get, that is a photographer with a camera. Like that one, no, right? Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> Yeah. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like that. Okay, so okay, so that, that's perfect. So don't worry about it. It's all about the it's all about the equipment. It's about the it's about the photography, right? So if if you're at that level where you need to put, uh, you know, and I would argue, and I know wedding photographers are watching this and rolling their eyes and saying, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna show. I have to show up with this because I need to look better than Uncle Bob that also has a white lens on his Canon, and I'm charging twenty thousand dollars to shoot this wedding. So, it's a, it's theater at some point where you know where if you if it's all about the art, then yeah, who cares? You could show up with this, but in the world of business, an aspect of it is theater, and you have to show up with something that looks like it's a quote unquote professional setup. Right. And by the way, let me let me say one thing quite clearly that um, if you read my I wrote a very in-depth article about the advantages of this over the Sony full frame system. Mm -hmm. But I was also extremely fair in it. And I said, look, this works really well for my kind of photography. And I list out all the situations where you may want to stay with a, a Nikon or a Canon full frame system, because there are some real advantages to these big DSLRs. There's no doubt about it. Um, like one example uh, might be like uh, uh, let's say that you're doing sports and someone is running at you and you've got this nice you know uh, big lens and mm -hmm. uh, they're coming at you and you want to be adjusting the focus as they're running at you and get a ton of photos before it starts to buffer well the yeah. DSLR is much better for that uh, this does shoot 10 frames per second uh, which is super fast but not if you're having to change focus all the time um, so, you know, it's not a slam dunk that this is definitely what you want to get a bunch of shots of a, a maybe a, a bride walking down the aisle towards you. Uh, but maybe as a second camera, uh, it's really up to you. Uh, but you should you yeah. should play with it and try it a few times. And uh, maybe you'll find out it's a good system. But again, in, in your world where it's mostly landscapes, right? They're they're generally not going to be moving to and from the camera. You're on a tripod most of the time, right? So no, I think. That's my favorite thing about shooting off by myself, you know, abandoned places or cities or architecture or, or uh, landscapes because there's no other human there. Um, and so you get to wrestle with your own incompetence in the solitude of nature rather than wrestling with incompetence while someone else is sitting there because, you know, even me, you know, I, I've taken, you know, hundreds of thousands of photos. Every now and then I'm like, all right, I got to compose this thing or I've got the wrong lens on or I, I got to go into the settings, you know, and figure out like where in this masochistic Japanese UI system is that stupid thing that I want to flip, you know? So, you know, nature doesn't mind if I'm goofing around while I do that. Right. Um, luckily, I don't have to do that in front of clients. <laughs> yeah, I want to get into that. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, a ton of questions roll in. So people that are watching this, definitely submit your questions. I'm going to go through them in a second here once I get through my questions, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Trey, one, one of the other things is... Um, uh, bokeh, you know, so the idea of, or the, it, it's basic physics, right? With a smaller sensor, no matter what optics you put in front of that sensor, the depth of field or the bokeh or bokeh, depending on how you want to pronounce it, in other words, the, the look of the out of focusness of the area behind the point of focus is less on a smaller frame sensor than it is on a, on a uh, full frame sensor. So I know you're doing landscape, so who cares, right? So it's not really relevant to you, but have has that issue come up at all in your travels at all? Well, the the bokeh, I say bokeh. Um, mm -hmm. That's how the Japanese say it, right? I don't know. Who don't knows? Know. This is who knows? this is one of these perennial questions <laughs> that'll never be answered. Right? They'll but never be answered. Damn word. Let's come up with a new word. How about um, out of focusnessness? -ness <laughs> Yeah. Blur. So, how, about how about blur? Ra Ra and blur. There you no, go. I don't need to brand it like that. Dave. So uh, I, I do actually do quite a bit of bouquet work. I, I uh, especially with my kids and I don't publish much of that. Right. I've taken, I've taken thousands of photos of my kids with this. And even though what you say is very true, 
bokeh is better on the big full frame DSLRs. The bokeh on this is just fine. Okay, there's there's gradients of like amazing bokeh to no bokeh right along. Right, right. And this is just this is good enough. Like if you're using on your full frame system a, a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens, for example, yes. you're gonna get this wonderful buttery nice background. Yes. Uh, but for something like this, actually, the lens that I have on here right now, this is the Zeiss uh, 1.8 32 millimeter. Okay, this is a prime lens. Yeah. But man, the bouquet looks amazing on it. It's more than good enough. Um, you know, only if I were to put it side by side with something else would I see that the bouquet isn't quite as good. But it's still perfectly out of focus. It's still perfectly blurry. You know, if you're in if you're in Photoshop, right, and you use this Gaussian blur thing, you get to move this slider. Well, maybe you want to blur it like at uh, you know like a 15, right? Uh, and maybe this one only blurs it at maybe like a, a 12. Well, it's still totally blurry. It's still totally right. out of focus. Right. Uh, it's it's good enough, I say. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And I'll tell you, I was just digging while you were talking. One of my favorite lenses on the Micro Four Thirds system is this guy right here. Look at that. Let me show you how little that is. Look at that. So this is a this is a 45 millimeter um, uh, lens, a 45 millimeter 1.8, and it uh, the bokeh or bokeh or red cliffian Gaussian blurredness. <laughs> All the, out of this thing is just insane, and it just this is one of the first lens I purchased for the for the OMD, and just it, it's like magic that what you get out of this little tiny thing that I can go, go in my shirt pocket, you know, it's yeah. it's insane because of that because of the whole the dynamics and the physics and the optics around mirrorless cameras, you can get a lens this small. So yeah, can it's you insane. Say something about shirt pockets. You just made me think of something. Yeah, I'm used yeah. to carrying around a giant backpack full of all kinds of nonsense. You know? Right, and actually, I got pretty good at my backpack. I didn't. I stopped needing to fill up every pocket at some point, you know, because there's a there's an empty pocket that's just begging for a lens, isn't it? And you just end up carrying <laughs> on. Yes. Okay. But anyway, so now when I walk around, I actually I don't carry a bag. I just wear like a, a jacket, a regular jacket, because these lenses they just fit right in my pocket. Um. So you know, my my pockets might bulge a little bit, but I don't I don't carry a a bag anyway. So you're not so when the like when you were running around China, you had an NEX hanging around your neck and and some lenses in your pockets and that's it. And maybe some batteries, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe an extra battery or two. Um and I have my tripod. I'm sort of a tripod kind of guy. Right, right, um, of course. But yeah, I didn't have to carry around a bag with all this, you know, F two point eight giant glass in it. Because like you said, this so this is my 70 to 200 lens. Let mm -hmm. me take off this bayonet just for comparison purposes. That yeah. that really skews the uh, situation. So this is 70 to 200, yeah. And this this one is uh, 82 to 315. I mean, look at the look at the difference and the yeah. weight yeah. is uh, there. There's just come on. So quality wise, I mean, I've seen the shots, but describe it. You're from you being the guy behind the lens, right? The quality why quality from both of those lenses on the respective bodies there there's got to be a trade off right i mean it, we're talking physics here so the the trade off of using that big massive expensive precisionly tuned nicor glass piece of equipment versus the smaller one that's barely the size of a can of coke optics wise are you as an artist seeing any difference um, no, I'm not seeing uh, any difference at all, or any difference that I occasionally see might be negligible, maybe at 100%. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I tell you, even with great lenses, you still get chromatic aberration on my Nikon. Right. I get a little bit on this, too. Um, same thing with noise. There's a little bit of noise at 100 ISO, but easy enough to clean up in, in Lightroom. So let me show you a few images here. I'm sharing my screen for people that are watching. And I've shared all high-res photos uh, that you can see. So actually, I took this one in, in San Francisco before I even went to China. I just took it out, out of a window at mm -hmm. night. Um, you know, I had no noise problems at all. Um, and let also look, I mean, let's be frank. I post-process unapologetically the heck out of my photos. All right. And so, you, get a, you get a lot of flack out of, for that too as well. Yeah, right? I don't care. I, you know, people who are against um, post-processing photos, you know, they're, you know, if they're virulently against it and just mean, I don't even talk to them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so anyway. So the uh, so to answer that question, you're you're okay. So shoot. Oh, yeah. that was beautiful. So shooting shooting with the, like if you, if you were to shoot with your D eight hundred with the equivalent focal length lens on that, you're you're not you're not sacrificing by moving to the NEXX, right? So you're you're no, okay there. Not at all. Like this one, uh, this is in Beijing. This was shot uh, really quite late at night, and I was able to get super sharp focus. Actually, you know, frankly, sometimes with my D800, it was a little soft when you got into 100%. I had trouble nailing the focus. But with this mirrorless system, you know, I was able to zoom in to 100%, um, and it's got this thing called focus peaking, and mm -hmm. just make sure that I got all this stuff totally nailed in camera because you're actually seeing what's on the sensor. So right. I was able to get all these shots. Um, you know, some of these are handheld. This is at night. Again, you get a little bit of noise at night with this smaller sensor at 100 ISO, but it's so easy to clean up that noise in Lightroom Nikon nowadays. or not Nikon. Um, the Lightroom Five, especially, will just eat that noise for breakfast, right? Yeah, it's no problem, you know. And then the raw files are nice and thick, and you can go in and do all kinds of adjustment, you know. Again, people that are into post processing, they are against post processing. They they're first to say that any kind of post processing is impure. I think it's wrong to say that any creative process is impure. This is taken right. with that zoom lens. This is at about 300 millimeter. This is just, you know, right out behind my house. This was the super moon when it was setting. And it says a lot, you know, because I've got all these awesome Nikon lenses. And I yeah. want to get the, look, the super moon, it doesn't come around very much, Fred. I want right. to get a good shot of the super moon. So, and I've got an amazing Nikon equipment with great lenses, you know, why wouldn't I go get my Nikon amazing stuff that I'm comfortable with? It says a lot that I whipped out my, my little NEX and I shot this, you know? I mean, yeah. no one's keeping score. I'm not doing this for any purpose. I want the best image of the super moon, and I use yeah. the NEX to get it. That's amazing. I mean, that's a that's a jump that a lot of people need to that will need to make, and I, I personally am, I think I'm sort of mid-peak in that jump because, you know, I love my OMD, which is a smaller frame, um, but still, it's that, hey, if it's bigger and it's got more bells and whistles and dials and it takes up more space and atoms, it must be better than something that, you know, that I could throw in my glove compartment, you know, <laughs> so, which is not necessarily true, right? Well, you know, you kind of hinted at something that, you know, my, uh, my process for getting into this camera was actually a bit of a weird one, frankly, because I've had it for over a year. All right, because I was interested in it. You know, I was uh, NEX curious, so I thought, well, mm -hmm. I'll buy it, you know, and just yeah. play with it. But what happens is when you have two, two cameras in the house, all right, you've got, you've got your one that you're super used to that you've been shooting with for years, and then you get this mm -hmm. new, you know, little um, Asian model mm -hmm. in the house. You think, man, if I'm going to go out and take a shot of something critical, if I'm in a clutch situation, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to go with something I know really, really well. And that's right. basically what I did for most of the last year is that, well, you know, there's a beautiful sunset over here in New Zealand. I'm going to, I'm going to grab my Nikon and my 1424 and go out and shoot it, even though I had this in the house. So what happens is that when you've got two systems going, you'll end up, no matter how open my, because I'm, I would argue that I'm one of the most open-minded photographers in the world. And I'm more than happy to try new technology and play with the best stuff. But in clutch situations, I would find myself leaving this little one at home and just using this big one. Yeah. Um, so not until I set my mind to it, said, okay, I am not going to use my Nikon for a month, and I'm just going to use this. And when I forced myself into that situation, now I see the light. And I leave that one at home, and I take this one out all the time. I love it. All right, before we jump into the the listener or viewer slash listener questions, um, one one more question from me. So durability wise, so these the bigger cameras are weather sealed. I mean, when I was in the military, I dropped a Nikon F three from a hovering helicopter that was at about the tree 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 uh, height of some eucalyptus trees onto the ground. The lens broke. We landed. I picked up the lens. Or picked up the camera and the lens, put a different lens on it, and continued shooting. Changed the film, of course, um, but continued shooting. It they're durable. These things you could you could mug somebody with your Nikon, right? Yeah. 
but not so much with any any X. So are is it durable? You're you're the perfect use case because you're traveling all the time. You and in mission critical situations, is the NEX seven or six that you own are either one of those cameras? Can they stand up to the wear and tear that a traditional DSLR would? Yes. Uh, by the way, I, I remember that scene from the movie with you in the Navy on the aircraft carrier, and that happened, and then and then the thing came across the deck, the chain, and got the legs. No, the, that scene. That that um, wasn't me. That was somebody oh, else. Yeah. Sorry, I get, I get confused. <laughs> Uh, I'm hearing Top Gun music playing, even though it was the Air oh. Force, not the Navy, Trey. Anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so uh, to answer your question, in this long article I wrote where I talk about the deficiencies of the NEX versus these professional full-frame Nikon bodies, yeah. um, weather sealing and the ruggedness is a definite problem. Um, now, uh, I get scared taking my NEX out into rain and this stuff. I get really, sure. frankly, quite worried about it. I haven't had a problem with it yet. It's never broken. Uh, but it doesn't feel quite as rugged as my, my big Sony's, I mean, as my big Nikon's. Now, yeah. I hope they do uh, correct this in future versions. Actually, right now, I think we're in the middle, aren't we? We're in this crazy hinterland of yeah. camera technology. And I have no inside information from Sony about what's coming out next. But I think that they will make something that's more professional and more rugged and better. Now, you know, I have taken my, I took my Nikon D3X out in a, a pretty bad rainstorm in, in Hawaii and it broke. It just, it was too much rain and it, it absolutely broke. So I don't really have the utmost confidence in my Nikon in, in rain situations either. Oh, okay. I've also dropped the Nikon. It fell over on the tripod. It broke. It was unusable. I had to buy a, a, a second D800. Um, as a, that's a good example of my relationship with, uh, with Nikon. They didn't send me a new D800. I didn't ask. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but yeah, I went and bought a new D800 because it fell over and broke. So you know these professional tough cameras, they broke still. And right. here's a, here's another point. This thing it costs like a thousand dollars. So when you're a professional, you got to have a backup camera, right? So you don't have to buy a couple of three or four thousand dollar cameras. You could just buy a couple of one thousand dollar cameras and have enough money left over for a, a trip to Tahiti. You know. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I love, I could dive into that that price thing a lot, you know, and, and go into lenses and all that stuff. But the price differential is definitely far apart. D you know, depending on the lens, like this this particular lens, this thirty five to one hundred from Panasonic, it's pretty pricey. It's like a twelve hundred bucks plus around in there. So you're paying for the optics at that point. But let's uh, we can talk about that another time. Let's talk about some user questions before we run out of time here. Listener questions. Um, Let's start at the top here. So this first one, I believe, is from Blake Zimmerman. He says, I've noticed a different look to your edits since you started using the mirrorless system. Is this intended or, or just the way your photos have come naturally? Uh, well, Blake, that's a good question. And it's hard for me to get distance and know how my uh, look has changed. But it's true that I do continue to use new post-processing tools and um, I'm always trying new things. Um, I, I'm not that I'm constantly having to reinvent the look of my photos or anything, but I do find that my style changes over time. And just like there's new hardware becoming available, there's always new software tools. Actually, you can argue that's where the real innovation of photography is coming, is in the post-processing software mm -hmm. tools. And now, nowadays, I see this just as a way to go out and grab the happenstance light. It's sort of a starting point. And then I love getting back and post-processing it in Lightroom and these other tools. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably like what you're seeing is just an ever-evolving set of post-processing techniques of, of mine. I love it. And a slight interjected question on that for me. So the technology of mirrorless, um, does that mean, and you know, and sort of speaking to your question about it all being in the software, a lot of it being in the software, does that mean down the road you think we'll see technologies like Lytro's focus later technology make it into mirrorless cameras, whereas with the DSLRs, with the mirror and the optics and pentaprism, it's probably not possible? Yeah, I think we'll see the most innovation from these mirrorless cameras. Okay, cool. Exciting. Okay. All right. Uh, next question up is from Vina. Vina says, Trey, are there any types of accessories or filters you're finding to be the must-have for the NEX? 
Oh, well, I think it really depends on your style of photography. Uh, for me, uh, the thing that really pushed me over the edge, I think, was this lens, this uh, 10 to 18, uh, just because I wa always want to get in as much as I can in a landscape shot. Um, I don't really know anything about filters. Uh, I don't use filters. I go commando. Uh, so you'd have to, you know, Google that to find out some good filter information or maybe check uh, Gordon's Camera Lab site. Um, but yeah, I think it's such a, it's just such a simple camera. You don't need to trick it up with a bunch of different things. Um, I'm actually jealous of some of you micro four thirds people. Uh, cause I have some, I've seen a lot of these cameras that are so tricked up with their own viewfinders and extra battery packs and just mm -hmm. all this nonsense that's happening. It just feels like this wonderful little Frankenstein of a camera. I do that's wish right. I could actually do some of that with my NEX. So I hope hey. in future versions, they make it more modular. I have personalized my little OMD here, dude. So look at this. So it uh, has a ha a leather half case on there, a braided leather case, a braided leather camera strap. It's got, you know, I've blacked out with tape the the logo of the manufacturer there. So it's just, it just looks like camera. That was the point, to make it look like a camera, a generic camera. And it and it does. It's It works. No, okay, it's awesome. next question. Like when you're playing an RPG game and you take your sword into the blacksmith and you get like a plus one upgrade to it and you're doing all this crazy stuff. I wish I could do that to my camera. I'm jelly. Yeah. Well, you can, you know, they're cheap. Go buy another one. Okay. So here's a, here's a question from um, Zoe Sim. I think I, I pronounced his name right. He says, as much as I love the NEX, um, he got one for his parents. Do you feel the limited maximum ap aperture is a holdback um, or maybe not for your type of photographer, photography? Well, uh, in other words, shallow depth of field. Do you do you feel like that is? Uh, we talked about that a little bit before, but do you care? I don't think so. This this camera does uh, 1.8 f 1.8. Mm -hmm. That's not so bad. Uh, yeah. I have a uh, a tiny. I should get it, but it's over there. Like it's this thick. It's an adapter that lets me use uh, Leica lenses on it, and I also right. have a, a Leica 1.2 f 1.2 lens. And I mean, that's not bad. That's pretty good in terms right. of uh, aperture. So I right. think you can get what you want uh, with this NEX. Perfect. All right, here's a, a slightly non-photography question from Emily Noren. She says, silly question, I know, but where in the world are you? <laughs> ah, I am in, uh, uh, I'm in Queenstown, New Zealand. Uh, my, it's the middle of winter here. My fire has just gone out. It was blazing a minute ago, but now it kind of... <laughs> It's it actually it's not easy to keep a fire going. There's an art to it. I lived I lived in Texas my whole life where we didn't have a lot of fire, so right. apparently this one's gone out. All right, here's another question from Nathan Firebaugh. He says, "Did you find yourself shooting more with the NEX once the firmware update for auto bracketing was released? I hardly used mine until until it came out." Um, yes, uh, this is a good gateway to talk about uh, the good and bad of auto bracketing on this camera. So when it first came out, for some reason, it only stepped by 0 0.7. So you could take three photos, negative 0 0.70 and plus 0 0.7, which is a very strange thing. But mm -hmm. Sony did something incredibly unexpected. I have very low expectations of these Japanese uh, camera manufacturers when it comes to firmware updates. Mm -hmm. But they did a firmware update, and then magically you go all the way from plus 3 to minus 3, which is a tremendous range. Right. Now things that I would still like it to do are A, I'd like to take more than three photos. That seems like a strange, it's just software. You know, mm -hmm. Let us do whatever we want. You know, uh, The other thing that I don't like about it is that I can't use a timer to instigate the auto bracketing right. uh, for whatever reason. Uh, they make it so you have to actually hold down the shutter. You have to hold down this button while you take all three photos. Can you, use, can't a, you use a remote release or something? Uh, you can use a remote release, but not with auto bracketing. Okay. Um, and so, uh, even though I've got I've got this giant tripod, I've got this big old really right stuff rugged tripod. I did get a smaller head for this smaller camera, but mm -hmm. it's it's very solid. And even when I am sitting there in low light situations and holding down the shutter, I still get uh, camera shake, which sucks. So basically, in low light, and I have a video up part of the review that shows how I do auto bracketing uh, in these low light situations with this camera. Love it. Cool. All right. Um, here's a question from Brent um, Berzicki. He says, 
Did you shoot a lot of video? He's considering using the U, the new NEX7 as a mount on the bottom of an aerial photography platform. So he's curious on your thoughts with video use with that particular camera. Uh, yes, I have shot a lot of video. It's great. It's all high def. Um, it's uh, you know the quality of the cam quality of the video depends on how stable it is and mm -hmm. this sort of thing. And if you're mounting it on the bottom of a chopper or whatever, I think it'll be. All right. There's actually um, uh, my, my I have a, a friend um, that did that attached his NEX to a quadcopter, mm -hmm. and uh, man, really, it looked, uh, it, it looked pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It would have to be a pretty big quadcopter to get one of these uh, DSLRs. <laughs> yeah. On there. My, Might my, have my to question just, was Matt Morton, by the way. Oh, that was Matt Morton. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry, Matt. All right, uh, here's another question. This is from a person with a name written in kanji or Chinese characters, so I can't read it. Um, it says, Trey, in your article you stated that you use the NEX6 for day-to-day -day and the NEX7 for your epic landscapes. Do you find the NEX7's slow focus the cause for that? Uh, yeah, this is a good opportunity to talk about the NEX6 versus the NEX7. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I do, you know, I, I hinted at this earlier. I love the idea that I can buy a second backup camera so inexpensively uh, compared to what I'm used to paying. So then I thought, well, should I get another NEX7 or should I get an NEX6? And the NEX6, I think, is better at a few things. Um, it's uh, got less megapixels, 16 megapixels. So one thought is that um, it'll do better in low light. I'm not, I haven't really tested enough to know that for sure. But usually when you have the same size sensor and you have less megapixels in it, it seems more sensitive to light. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it's got like 99 focus points rather than 16 or whatever that's on this. So I have tested it uh, with this lens in particular, this, this prime lens is 1.8 and usually I'm like mm, I can't really tell if it's focusing faster when I test cameras I'm like it seems to focus pretty fast on every camera mm -hmm. I don't know but there's a huge difference between how fast it focuses on the NEX6 versus the NEX7 so I find that with the NEX6 um, I'm using it to take a lot of people photos or object photos or photos of my family things that require quick focus um, landscapes I don't really care if it focuses very fast yeah. Now, are you like in your when you're out and sh you're out and about on a on a typical Trey Ratcliffe shoot? Are you do you have both bodies with you with a lens a different lens on either one, or it is you know you leave one at home? Does one in a bag for backup? How does how does your flow work? Um, I do. I take both cameras with me. Um, usually, I've got the NEX seven um, attached to my tripod all the time. I know that they say you're not supposed to walk around with your camera attached to the tripod. But I do it all the time. I'm, I'm safe with it. You know, I never <laughs> knock it into anything. Right. It's like I think the people that carry live ordinance, they're very safe with it. People don't drop babies because when you're carrying a baby, you're always thinking about the baby. So it, I, anyway, I have it on the tripod. And then I've got my second camera, my NEX6, just slung over my shoulder. Because like let's say that I'm walking through a city, um, which I'm often doing, and then I just set up my tripod for a photo. Well, maybe someone interesting walks by or I see a cool street sign or a street light or a fire hydrant or whatever the heck. Well, it's, it's awesome having a second camera that I can just take that photo with uh, because even though it's, you know, lickety split to change lenses on this, changing lenses is still a little bit of a pain and it, yeah. it does interrupt your flow. So it's nice having a second camera there to take pictures of people, objects, and things that's always ready to go. Love it. Love it. And, and it's a backup in case one fails, right? Yes. Yep. All right. Harold Bautista says, uh, do you think that once full frame mirrorless cameras come out, that it will be the end of the big DSLR? Well, I got in a lot of trouble from photographers for over a year ago, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, I wrote an article that said DSLRs are a dying breed. Mm -hmm. And people found this very threatening or whatever. Uh, I didn't say they're dead. I just said they're dying. You know, I mean, the, the trend is clear that these cameras are getting better and better and better. They can do as much and sometimes more than a DSLR can, especially with all the smart software that's enabled when you go to a, a mirrorless system. Yeah. Um, so I think that DSLRs will still, you know, nothing really dies nowadays. Uh, it'll hang around. And 
there's so many great lenses for uh, DSLRs, especially for specialty situations, which will get pushed more and more to the edge as these become more and more able. But like for example, one specialty situation for DSLRs that will hang around for longer than most, I think would be like wildlife photography or bird photography. Because there's these amazing, you know, four, five, six hundred millimeter lenses um, yeah. that work on those cameras that um, just aren't going to be available natively in these for a long time. Uh, so I don't know if DSLRs will ever like be totally dead, but they're going to be just really pushed to the edges of the photography world. Interesting. All right. Um, oh, Chris by the way, Brooks, I, yeah, I, I can I can sense people fuming out there. I have a paragraph at the end of my current story that says, "Look, if you have a Nikon a disclaimer. DSLR or a, a Canon DSLR, I'm not saying you got to switch now. I mean, who cares what I do, right? right. Uh, but uh, you know, I would just start being open-minded about it. Your current camera will serve you really, really well for the next several years. It could serve you well for a lifetime. But you know how it is." Uh, you always end up upgrading every few years, right? So right. next time it comes around to upgrading, don't just automatically think, okay, I'm going to buy another multi-thousand dollar DSLR. I'm going to see what's up next. You know, look on the other side of the fence. See what other options are available. That's way cheaper, way lighter, and can help you produce just as interesting images. Yeah, so now now the, uh, the decision-making process goes from do I buy a Nikon or a Canon to do I buy Nikon, Canon, or do I go mirrorless and buy Panasonic, Olympus, or Sony, <laughs> you know, do I yeah. go Micro Four Thirds or APS-C, you know, so yeah, it's, it's getting insane now. All right, Chris Brooks says, have you found that you shoot less or fewer HDR shots? Uh, now that the, uh, you know, the, with the fewer, the question scrolled up the screen, but with the fewer auto bracketing steps that the NEX can take? No. Um, I'm taking exactly the same kind of shots that I've always wanted to take. And uh, I've always said that actually for 95% of HDR situations, you really only need three exposures, minus two, zero, and plus two. I used to take a whole raft of photos with that, uh, D800 or the other Nikon professional systems because for whatever reason again it's only software I don't know why these Japanese companies shut everything down and don't open it up but uh, the Nikon would only let you step by one so I ended up taking like five exposures from minus two to plus two now that other five percent of the situation for HDR when you're shooting into the Sun for example then I do like to have a wider range I might like to go from minus three to plus three for example mm -hmm. yeah. well this this does that uh, but also, um, I'll take it out of auto bracketing sometimes, and I'll just manually pick the exposure, put it on a two-second timer, and then hit the, and do hit it. the shutter and wait it takes the photo. So the only thing auto bracketing does is it saves you a little bit of time from having to go take multiple photos. Right? You get to push the button once instead of pushing the button and moving the dial and pushing the button and moving the dial. Look, it's not the end of the world if you got to push the button and move the dial. It takes a few more <laughs> seconds. Uh, but I think that they're going to fix these auto-correct problems soon. I mean, auto-bracketing problems soon. Cool. And it's just software, right? Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Al Steffen says, in your article, you mentioned apps on Sony. Do the new Android cameras like the recently announced Samsung, Samsung NX1000 excite you in that department? They do. This, You know, these Samsung uh, cameras um, or you know, God forbid, if Google starts making cameras or Apple starts making cameras, they could be super disruptive across the whole industry because, you know, Fred, you and I, I think, are, are believers that software is really the most exciting thing that will drive the future of photography. And 100%. so hardware becomes increasingly marginalized over time. So the camera systems that have the most exciting software and the most open software are going to rule the day. Now, we all know and love things like Android and iOS because it allows many developers to make a wide variety of apps for a common platform. But these these Japanese monolithic thinkers, like, you know, you name it, you know, Pentax, Sony, um, uh, is, Pint is Pentax Japanese? Um, yeah, let's say they are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I don't know anyone with it. Uh, sure. But anyway, let, let's just let's just say let's, let's say Olympus, Olympus, Sony, Nikon, Nikon, Canon. Canon. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So anyway, let's just st step back and think about it. Each of them has their own operating system, which is totally closed down. 
And this is actually a very Japanese way of thinking, to have a closed system that only they develop for. Now, I think this is the wrong way to go. If you look at the success that Google has had with Android and Apple has had with iOS, having an open API that allows many people to build apps makes the entire ecosystem better and creates a lot of excitement and more use and a bigger community around these, these items. So I think yeah. the first Japanese company, major Japanese camera making company that is going to open up their software or choose just to put Android on there, right? Then things are gonna go crazy. People are gonna be so excited about it. And one thing I rail against in my rail is, is too, that's too extreme. I get upset with Sony about in my little article about the NEX6. So one cool thing about the NEX6 is you can put on apps, all right? And it's ridiculous the way they chose to do it because A, they make their own apps. Other people can't make apps for it. Right. Um, you have to go to this really clunky Sony app store and then you know you buy the app in this very clunky way and then you got to hook up your, your USB cord and install it and then you have this new app on your, and the apps aren't really that great. There's a few that are neat. And then they charge you money for these apps. You know, they're like a dollar or two or something like that. Some are free, but you know, why Sony, if you're making a thousand dollar camera, are you trying to make a few extra dollars off these, you know, mediocre apps? <laughs> I, I can see in their marketing meeting, you know, they're all sitting around a table like, oh, you know, Angry Birds has made millions of dollars. We should sell apps. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And then, then they just really, it's clearly a design by committee. Um, and that's why you never see a statue of a committee. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right, Chris Johnson says, hey Trey, for someone fresh into the camera market, how do they decide which mirrorless camera to choose from? There's so many options from Olympus to Fuji to Sony. What's a guy to do? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, uh, it reminds me of, uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're getting ready to go to Burning Man. This is a good analogy, okay? Yeah. We're getting ready to go to Burning Man. And I've, I've gone four times, uh, so I kind of know the score, and I've got my out. you got to dress up for the entire week. It's like a week of Halloween. And if you dress yeah. normal, you know, like if you're all JQ, J, I mean, J Crew, GQ, then you look weird. So you gotta, you got to dress up. you got to get into you gotta it. Be, right? you got to be Mad Max Thunderdome, right? Yeah. Uh, plus, it makes for great photography. When you have 50,000 people in costume, it's great for photography. So anyway, yeah. you got to dress up. So this year, I'm actually going with, uh, with my wife and my son, my 12-year-old son. And so they've got to get their outfits. And we're going with my, my other friend, Cliff Bays, and his wife and his son. And we're going to this area called Kids Camp. Uh, with the, they have like 400 kids in like this part of Burning Man. It's going to be great. So anyway, my, my wife is going through and picking out her outfits and stuff. And she's on Etsy and looking at all this stuff. And she's overwhelmed at all the various outfits she can get. You know, like, oh, should I get yeah. this one or should I get that one or should I get this you know, I'm like, God, I don't know. Just, just choose. They're all good. And that's what I feel like about cameras. Like, it doesn't matter. Just, just choose one. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can go micro four thirds. You can go Sony. Um, you can go with some of the, you know, smaller DSLR systems. Um, it doesn't really matter because if, you know, this is a, a serious game that these big manufacturers are playing. And if it is a, a camera that's out there, it's probably good enough for you. Uh, yeah. So once you get the system, get into it and, and love it and get to know it, um, I think you're going to be okay either way. You, you should be excited by the variety of choices, not overwhelmed by it, because the variety of choices means you're going to end up making a good decision no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, From the, it, it's kind of like don't obsess over which paintbrush you're going to use, paint. <laughs> right. Just get, get out there and shoot. Pick one and start shooting. It's about the photography, not about the tools so much. So, yeah. And the tools, like you were saying, the tools are so cool and so good nowadays. It's not like you're going to make a insanely bad decision regardless. You're still going to be able to execute whatever vision is in your mind's eye. So get out there and shoot. Right. All right. Another question here is from Lim Nelson. He says, what would you rather photograph, tennis or water polo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, I think he's channeling uh, Nikon with this question. Let me let me answer this question. So, let's say tennis. You got to set okay. it up. You got to set it up because set up the why he's asking this question. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it's a serious question. I'm going to answer this, uh, Fred. So let's say it's tennis. 
Well, yes. hmm. maybe I will get out my Nikon f 2.8 70 to 200 millimeter lens VR2. Yes. And maybe I'll zoom in and get some action shots of the tennis players, or maybe I can get that ball as it's moving if I set it to AFC. Um, or maybe uh, I'll get up in the stands and I'll use like a, a Nikon uh, 400 millimeter lens F4, but I don't know. Am I allowed to, to use this kind of lens in there? Can I get in with the audience? Will they let me have this camera while I'm up in the stands? Or maybe yeah. let's go to water polo. Well, you know, if there's a sport I've ever wanted to shoot, it's, it's water polo. You know, I think, man, if I could just get into a water polo match, I would go crazy. But then you got more questions like, do I have an underwater housing? Am I going to get underwater and shoot <laughs> these water polo players from underneath? You know, and how much is the housing and which, which lens should I use? Or am I going to get above the water and get some action shots of the water drops? I mean, there's so many questions to answer. Yes. I think it is a fucking brilliant question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and you're going to leave it at that <laughs> yeah I love it I love it so to get the context of that question go to Trey's article on his switch from NEX from the NEX or uh, from Nikon to the Sony brand and find out what we're talking about it's definitely somewhere in that 1000 <laughs> somewhere in the article it's in there somewhere no actually right. I, I will, let me comment for a second on these big Japanese companies and social media uh -oh. because they are ridiculous in a lot of ways. Do not start now, another world war please Trey. First, Just... <laughs> well let's remember that these Nikon guys these are the same people that said uh, this is on their F Facebook page or Twitter or someplace they said they go a photographer is only as good as the, as the equipment he uses. Okay, this oh, is a yeah, ridiculous statement. Who comes up with these things that they put out? Just they put up these inane things in order for people to engage. And actually, it's quite depressing because in that one question they asked, you know, there's like hunt, there's like thousands of responses. Uh, like, what would you rather shoot, tennis or water polo? It's depressing. Right. People are saying like, oh, you know, water polo. Like, well, I get sometimes I get depressed when I look out there at the landscape of <laughs> people. People are really interested in that question. Think about that the question, nature of the that, question. That question smacks of uh, someone that was appointed to be in charge of social media, trying to fulfill a, you know, put a post on social media at least once a day type directive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But actually, I can let me say something good about Sony. Uh, uh, Sony actually responds, um, actually on Google+. Uh, they put yeah. responses in um, all the time. They put nice responses in mine. Um, and other people, they're quite active, and they seem like they, they've got a good head on their shoulders. But having said that, I think that all these companies could do a better job in social media. And for, let's talk about the web for a second. I yeah. wish that these big Japanese camera companies would stop wasting millions of dollars putting ads in photography magazines. I don't know who reads these photography magazines, but not many people. They should take an ever-increasing percentage of that advertising budget and move it to the web. They should sponsor shows like This Week in Photography. This is where people make uh, decisions about what to buy. You, Fred, you should have so much money pouring in. I'm not just saying this because you're my friend. I mean, objectively, you uh, and other podcasts and other websites that talk about this stuff, you guys should be drowning in ad money, which right now is going to this old school um, uh, magazine system. Right. So I think, it's, uh, I think it's a disaster what's happening out there. It's going to change. But there's all these old school relationships that still manage uh, so much of the budget, which is just, um, I think it's sad, but it's going to change. Just you're, wait you about. It, you're, you you're in the right it, spot. You hit it right on the head because you know the internet is where people learn about stuff and then where they also then one click away, they make that purchase decision, right? So why force them to say, you know, because I, I see billboards still and I, I just shake my head, you know, I'm like, okay, I see that billboard. Okay, now I need to remember to go look that thing up when I get to a computer and then make a purchase decision right there. So it, it just yeah. doesn't work. It's like money going out of there. Whereas if I'm online somewhere, I see something, oh, that's interesting. Trey recommended this particular thing. I click on a link, I'm there, I buy it, I'm off to the next thing. You know. So you're, you're absolutely right with that. All right, Ke Kevin Crewell says... Is the larger NEX sensor the reason you chose the NEX and not Micro Four Thirds from Panasonic or Olympus? He's channeling me. So. Yeah, 
Uh, well, this is this is a good question. Actually, I don't know why I chose Sony over the Micro Four Third system. It was shiny. I think, uh, I, think I just wanted. Uh, I just knew I wanted a smaller system. And like the earlier question asked, like I'm confused. I don't know which one to get. Well, when you get into this, I didn't know the difference between the NEX system and the Micro Four Third system. Um, and I think actually when I chose about a year and a half ago, they were you know no one really knew too much. I just knew I wanted a smaller system. And I looked at Sony, and I, I like their lenses, and I think that I think they're a company with some staying power. And also, this is going to sound like a really stupid excuse, Fred. I'm sorry for it. But uh -oh. the word micro four thirds, I didn't know what the hell it meant, and I'm just, I still barely know what it means. Actually, I do know what it means, but it's it must be the worst <laughs> marketing term for a uh, a group of people to come up with as a common standard. I mean, it's the word. It doesn't mean anything. It's the most it had it had two na two words in there that you didn't like. You know, micro and small, four thirds, right? So it can't be good, right? <laughs> well, I don't even understand the four. Why did they say four thirds? You know, why don't they say one and one third, or why don't they come with a fraction? It's strange right. to have the numerator bigger than the denominator when you're describing a fraction. No, no one else does that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, Trey. Your your geek is showing. I'm sorry. You might want to tuck that back in. <laughs> Man, I'm serious. This is one thing that drove me away. That it frustrated me that it was such a big numerator. Yeah, yeah. So your your decision was arbitrary. It wasn't like okay, I no. I have this big spreadsheet, and after all of my people, you know, sort of did the math, we came up with the Sony NEX, and that was that yeah. was the. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. All right, so we we've got we've got a ton of questions still rolling in. I only have a couple of. I know we don't have that much time left, but I want to get through some of these. Um, uh, I'm gonna scroll down here. So Joseph Z. Uh oh, sorry, Joseph. Your question scrolled off as I was looking at your question. All right, I'm gonna try to hold this one right here. It says Tammy McLeod says besides the 10 to 18, what other lenses are you carrying for the NEX7? Um, I don't carry that many lenses. I've got uh, so I've got this one that I mentioned earlier. This is the uh, uh, how do you say that word? Tout. It's the Zeiss lens. It's one point eight thirty two. So I mm -hmm. like this one. They also have a uh, another one. I think it's a fourteen millimeter. Is that is that right? Do you know? But anyway, mm -hmm. I don't I don't like that one very much. It's too wide. It's got a good f-stop, but I don't really get the low f-stop, super wide angle lenses. I don't know what you use them for. I guess you get real close to kids or flowers and get, I don't use that one very much. Uh, but I also use the, um, uh, this one, which is the 55 to 200. Um, I use the kit lens quite a bit. Um, actually, if you look in that review, you'll find a third of the photos were taken with the kit lens. It's not bad. It's quite serviceable. And, um, uh, the other one that I use, of course, is the wide angle uh, 10 to 18. Love it. Cool. And that's all in the article I saw that listed. You've got links to both B&H and Amazon in there for all the lenses that you have. So yep. I suggest people go check out that article. Uh, Matt Madison says, on your final product printed image, is the NEX as sharp as the D800 and is it capable of similarly large printing outputs? Uh, yes, so this NEX7 is 24 megapixel, and I remember when I used to get prints back way before I had 24 megapixel, you know, I had 12 and 16 or 10 or 8 megapixels, and I was perfectly happy with my prints then, and I'm even more happy now. Um, so it is true that the D800 has 36 megapixels, um, which is quite a bit more than this, uh, but this actually has 50% uh, more megapixels than the Nikon D4, which is, you know, about six or seven or eight times as much in terms of cost and nine times bigger in terms of size, uh, physical size. So, you know, I think the prints are just fine. Um, uh, I haven't had, uh, I've gotten up really close to giant prints that I've done with this and looks perfectly fine to me. Love it. All right. Uh, person, again, with unpronounceable Chinese hiragana, katakana, or other name, I can't pronounce it, says, going back to your Nikons with companies releasing adapters for lenses for other brands, do you see yourself grabbing a Nikon to NEX speed booster to use your lenses on your NEX system? 
So this is an interesting area. I'm really, you know, when you ask which system have I chosen, why did I choose this one versus Micro Four Thirds? I don't think it matters which one you choose, but once I did make this choice, you get really into it. I'm like, okay, man, I'm Sony NEX. I got to, I'm going to figure out how to maximize this camera. And then so people started talking about this Metabones speed booster, which I actually hadn't heard of. I looked yeah. into it. It turns out like it's this big phenomenon. Every now and then I just I hear about something like on the edge of a conversation and then I go look at it, then I realize there's this whole movement behind it that I didn't knew nothing about. So yeah. anyway, these these Metabone speed boosters, they look pretty dang cool. And for the uninitiated, what it allows you to do, what I think it allows you, I don't have one yet, so I may not really understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but there's an adapter that you can put on the NEX or a variety of other cameras that then allow you to not only use lenses from other systems but it also uh, gets you like an extra stop of light mm -hmm. um, so um, I've thought about getting one for the NEX that will allow me to put on my 14 to 24 lens why you ask? only for this one edge case that I can't use this camera for and that is for astrophotography mm -hmm. uh, because uh, now I don't do a lot of astrophotography I see beautiful photos out there I've in fact, I have such respect for these people that do astrophotography. And I see these beautiful images. I really want to do it. You know, my my heart weeps when I see these beautiful images. I go, like, oh, God, I really Me want too. to go out. And yep. I want to just camp, you know, and have s'mores and just go check my camera every now and then. Looks like a great time. And these images are so wonderful. But I can't, I don't think I get a good astrophotography shot with this camera. So I, I keep my D800 for those edge cases in my photo life. But if I had that Metabone speed booster, um, then I could use this camera uh, for that situation. But then the question is, mm, for those edge cases, do I really want to get this special adapter just to use this camera when I can just go ahead and take my existing DSLR out there? I don't know. So anyway, the verdict is out on whether or not I'm going to get one of these Metabones. Love it. All right. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with these questions here. Here's one from Jonathan Usher. He says, I've done a ton of testing on the OMD versus the NEX7 versus the Sony A850 with various lenses. I found the NEX7 with the 85-28 Sony lens, a cheap lens, was as detailed and sharp for landscapes as my heavy A850 and CZ138 1.8 lens and my OMD with the 70. Okay, I think this was just a statement and not a question. All right, moving on to the next question. Well, that's good to know, actually. I'm, yeah. I'm glad that people are doing this hardcore testing because I do not do lab condition uh, <clears throat> testing, so I'm glad he did it. That's cool. Hey, I All have right. a question from Brian Matias. Oh, says, send that in. He says, Trey, will you sign the NEX7 that I just bought earlier today? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to sign it. I, I don't know if it'll go up or down in value, but I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Brian, don't be a fanboy. Come on. <laughs> All right, here's another question, Trey. Uh, it says, what's, what's, what is the out-of-camera raw quality versus the uh, full-frame Nikon? Um, and he's not saying the post-processed image, but the raw result as comparison with, uh, you know, with the NEX versus Nikon. Man, that, that is a really good question. I do not know the answer. I, um, I feel, and this is just very touchy-feely, uh, by the way. I have no science behind this. But I do feel like the RAW file that came out of that full-frame Nikon camera has more thickness in light than the NEX7. I feel like when I move the sliders on the RAW file for the Sony, I mean, for the Nikon, that I get a little bit more range. You know, it's got like more stops of light embedded mm -hmm. in that RAW file than for the NEX7. But I don't actually know. Um, and I don't know a way to definitively know. And if there is a way that's so, like maybe Gordon Lang or someone. I was totally going to say that. Is, I mean, Gordon. if anyone would know, Gordon Lang from CameraLabs.com. By the way, I'm not sponsored by CameraLabs.com, even though I've mentioned them so many times. He's just hey, a friend. Gordon, Gordon says that he's willing to do a hangout. Um, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to pull him into a hangout with me. Hopefully, if you, if you're available, um, we're going to bring Doug K in there, maybe Julio Schiorio of Small Camera Big Picture, and talk about these small cameras a, in a group and, and see what the group consensus is. We're going to do a jury thing and yeah. see what's going on. All right, Trey. Joseph Z says, Trey, are you going to sell all of your Nikon gear now? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. People want to come over and like borrow it or pick it up. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I don't know what to do with it. I, I like I said, I will keep my D eight hundred for astrophotography, or you know, we get a lot of aurora australis down here. It's not. It's called the Aurora Borealis on the Northern Hemisphere, but down here it's called the Aurora Australis. Cool. And it's, I can just see it in my backyard because I'm so far south. I'm quite close to Antarctica. And uh, so for those kind of shots, I'll keep my D800. Uh, I don't know what to do with my other Nikon systems. I just kind of stack them up. I kind of I like the look of them up there. But then, you know, I, I like stacking up all these lenses and cameras and stuff, and I think, oh, it looks kind of cool. You know, I can look back and reflect on my life. Uh, but uh, It's like rings in a tree, right? <laughs> it is. But then I go over and I see, like, some really hardcore photographer. They've got all this crazy shit. They've got all these brownies and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, my, my, comparison, my collection is so weak compared to some of these really hardcore guys. I'm like, uh, I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> I'm not cool with that. With it. Yeah. All right, Trey. Mike Mike Thompson says you mentioned the NEX has an APS-C with a 1.5 crop. What's the crop factor on the four third sensor? And I'm gonna say that it is two. So it is a, for example, this 45 millimeter lens is actually a 90. You know, so on a on a full frame sensor. So to answer that one, which is a great question, by the way. Uh, next question is from Eck Lundborough. Lung, he says, looking into the future, ever think something like Google Glass will become a powerful photographic tool? Uh, and by the way, for people that are watching this, Trey is actually wearing Google Glass right now and bragging that he can, he's a cyborg. <laughs> uh, I'm not bragging, I'm just wearing it. Uh, actually, I, I find that I, I use it... Uh, almost all the time. I very rarely look at my cell phone anymore just because it's so convenient. And I've taken so many photos with it. It's crazy, especially uh, family photos. Hmm. And it makes it really easy. I'm sharing... You actually, you know, one thing about Google Plus that I didn't realize until Vic said it in his keynote is that uh, over 50% of the Google Plus activity is private sharing that you never see. And I actually believe it now, especially with this, because I'm taking so many photos and just sharing them with my family of the kids, and I'm taking videos and just private videos, and they go all over the place. So it's really changed the way that I take personal, sort of casual photos. Uh, so yeah, it's been it's been great in that regard. Hey, let me ask a question to Dave. Dave, I know you got a, you're going out on a shooting uh, spree today. Do you need to run? I, I was. I canceled. What? Awesome. See, that's dedication that's right there. Show? Well, uh, uh, I'm sorry, man. I feel That's bad. All right. it's, it's really, really hot out, so I'm actually not too sad about it. Good. Uh, I love it. Thank you for canceling that, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah. That. The audience thanks you, too. Hey, by the way, are the questions coming up okay? Are, pe are Is the audience able to see them? Because I, the thing is that Dave is actually logged into my account to choose the questions so people can watch it. And I hope they actually go with the actual recording as a, a sidecar so people can well, it, fast it, forward. Well, it actually matches up, yeah. Okay, I was worried That's because great. I'm not seeing it, and I don't know which of our streams is actually going to YouTube and getting the sidecar attached. Well, my, mine is, is affect, the way I'm doing it is affecting, if you go to the questions interface as a viewer, what I'm doing Good. is showing up matching with the video. You'll see the question awesome. at the top. Awesome. Yeah. Well, then at the end of this, I'll have you click into broadcast. Sorry, this was all a little programming note. We're changing the engine on the car as we're driving. Go on, Fred. Well, we're we're definitely we're on we're dancing on the bleeding edge, and uh, yeah. you know I love it. What do you, what okay, do you think Joe, of this interface, uh, Fred? Do you think it's I'm really loving cool? it? This is cool. Yeah. I, you know, I would love. I have some comments, but it uh, you know for the most part, this is actually really cool. This is really yeah, cool. Uh, Joe Aronson says, and this is a little slightly to the left of topic. Trey, he says, um, good. I like you could, I like off top <laughs> off topic questions of my favorite kind. Well, here you go. He says, if you could spend money on a girl, how much would you spend? <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, well, let's, we could break down the budget that I have on my wife, uh, which is through the roof. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you should see just these Burning Man outfits alone. It is, it is a major endeavor. I, I, maybe we should not have gone to Burning Man. I should have just sent her on a shopping spree in Nordstrom's for... She'd be like a Melda Marcos coming out of that thing with so many shoes. It'd be nuts. <laughs> All right. Uh, our friend Brian Matias says, when will we see your, your glassware app 
that will give live view streaming for the NEX6 and other Wi-Fi enabled Sony cameras. Man, this is uh, this is a really exciting thing. Actually, we we do have a glassware app that's uh, a new one. It's contact me if you want to play with it and you have glass. It's a, a new thing where uh, you know you, you you wink into it and it actually takes uh, five or six photos all in a quick burst. What? And uh, it takes the the last photo. It will uh, um, the last photo is usually the best because actually it's quite hard to compose a photo with this. You actually end up having to take a few photos to see what you're getting. Um, so this is called like a tray burst. So it takes a whole burst of photos, and then uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's a free app now, of course, so you can you can play with. It. But this thing that he's talking about, I'm super excited about that because what you can do. Uh, theoretically, uh, is you can use this as the viewfinder for your camera so that you don't actually have to look through your camera, your EVF or your optical thing anymore. It can just Bluetooth uh, the, uh, the data right to your glass. So that'll, I mean, talk about shooting from the hip. I mean, you just have your camera down at your hip and you can see what you're, you're about to shoot up here. And, or you can aim it behind you or you can do, you can do whatever. So I think that this is a, a fairly significant sea change in the way that we take photos in that what you're seeing is actually quite far away from where the lens actually is. It's quite exciting. That's cool. You know, um, hopefully one day I'll get my hands on a pair of those, Brian. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, Zoe Sim says, if Sony or any other camera producer, for that matter, come out with a full-frame mirrorless system, will you consider switching to that? Uh, yes, this is, um, I put this in the article as well, what I really want, my, my Christmas list. Um, what I really do want is a full frame system with interchangeable lenses. Mm. I know there's a few full frame mirrorless systems out right now, but they have a fixed lens and I just, I need more flexibility. I think they're really good cameras, but the reason I don't carry them around is I don't want to carry around an extra camera that just does one thing really well because it's really just something else to think about. It's another memory card or something else to, to charge. I would, I would worry about it more than I would use it, I think. So yeah. um, this is what I really want. I don't know if Sony's going to make it um, first. I don't know if Nikon or Canon or someone else will make it first. Uh, but as long as it's not too big, this is the big worry that people have. Is that, oh, well, once you go full frame, your, your lenses are going to be giant. Right, this is what everyone yeah. says, but I don't know if that's necessarily true, um, uh, because of course I'm not really that interested in a full frame mirrorless with giant lenses. I don't want to go back to something big. Um, but then again, I really don't know much about optics. You know, there's a lot of optics nerds, and believe me, if 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 there's someone that's an optics expert, they will tell you they are an optics expert. You'll never <laughs> hear the end of what happens as light as it bends around all these things. Uh, but um, I I hope that they can make a, uh, a smaller lens system. Maybe it doesn't, maybe there's something in between, you know, that's like in between uh, this size lens and this size lens. You may yeah. be a, a half. I bet it will still be nice and light like this one. So it's not mm -hmm. just the size, but it's the weight, which you can't really see. Um, I do hope they make that. Um, and I'll have to buy all new lenses, of course, in this sort of situation, but... That's, that's okay. That's, that is what I want. Now, Trey, I remember a while ago, I think it was at the Google Plus conference, um, you, weren't you carrying around a Nikon 1, one of those little point and shoots? No, uh, I, no, no, I wasn't, I don't think. Uh, what were you carrying? carrying on, oh, I was probably carrying the NEX sort of. Okay, because I remember camera. you showing me that you were bragging about the right. focus peaking in there. Oh, and... no, no, that was, it was the NEX. That was during my year goofing around period before I really chose. And I had on the Leica 1.2 lens. Right, I remember and, that, yeah. Um, because these light, when you would attach one of these Leica lenses, it becomes manual, right? So you lose mm -hmm. the autofocus. But you do lose the autofocus with the NEX, with these manual lenses, but one thing you do gain is this thing called focus peaking. And I know some people know what this is, so I apologize for explaining yeah. something you already know. But for people that don't know what focus peaking is, let me describe it because it's, to me, one of the most exciting things about these mirrorless systems. So what you do is when you turn on focus peaking, you get to pick a color like red or green or yellow. 
All right. Mm -hmm. And then you you look at your you look at the back of the camera or you put your your eye up to the EVF with a nice dark background. That's what I prefer. And then you start to focus, you know, old school by turning turning your lens situation. And then whatever is in focus, you get this hot green, neon green outline around what's in focus. And it's like a video game. You know, it's like you're playing Call of Duty and you're in some sort of uh, infrared mode. And you have this yeah. amazing outline of whatever you're shooting. And it just pops out. It is, it's so weird. And it's like, it reminds me of those cool uh, binoculars that Luke Skywalker used during the right. Imperial right. attack on Hoth. You know, this is what it feels like because you know what's in focus. And then when you shoot it, you know that you've nailed it. There's no guesswork. Um, I found that even with a mirrored system, with my DSLR, there's always still a little bit of guesswork because that mirror flips up. And then if, there's a, if your sensor depth is off just a little bit, you might be a little bit soft. But with mirrorless and this focus peaking, you nail that exposure and the sharpness every single time. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, as people get older, that becomes more and more important because looking through the little viewfinder and trying to make sure things are in focus, yeah. you know, even with a diopter on there, you know, it can be a yeah. little challenging. Yeah. No, no. You always worry because it's like, oh, is my diopter setting? Is it not exactly what's coming off the mirror and the prism and all? You know, there's so many variables at work. But with focus peaking, you're looking at what the sensor sees. You're looking at what you're actually going to take a photo of and you nail the sharpness every single time. Love it. All right. Um, Eck Lundborough says, um, really, is the NEX, or the NEX7 can produce quality expected in product photography or, commer or a commercial studio, or is Trey saying um, it's for landscape and casual use? Well, I, I think it would be great for product photography because I see product photography is not that different from landscape because it's a totally controlled situation. Yeah. And um, especially with like this focus peaking we just talked about, you're sure that you're going to nail the focus. Because uh, I, when I look at product photography, and I don't, I don't do any of it, but I, I look at it, so I'm always interested when I look at ads and this sort of thing. Um, a lot of times you're going for some very nice depth of field type work where you want one part of the product to be in focus and everything else to fall away. Well, you get mm -hmm. to see live what you're actually going to see. Uh, I know with DSLR, it's a little bit of a guessing game. Like, I guess I'll shoot this at f1.8 and then 2.8 and 4. and Because you, you never really know how much depth you want to get. You're just kind of guessing, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I haven't done product photography, but I figure there's a bit of f-stop guesswork in it. Uh, but with this, when you're actually seeing what is on the uh, uh, on the sensor, all the guesswork goes away. Now, a caveat to these glowing things I'm saying about the ENIAC system is I don't really know how it works with lights. And I know in product photography, you end up having to use a lot of lights and soft boxes, and you know you just have these crazy uh, light situations. And I really don't know how the Sony operates with uh, with lights. Now, Trey, are you, you know, some of these, the, some of these mirrorless cameras, the OMD, and I know the, the, the uh, Panasonic GH3 have the ability. So basically when you're looking through the lens, especially on the GH3, when you're looking through the lens, you see exactly what you're going to see when you, which you're going to record to that SD card when you press the shutter, whether you're adding in, you know, traditional changes like f-stop and shutter speed, or if you're doing some sort of specific in-camera editing like black and white or sepia or you know HDR or whatever you see that before you press the shutter does the NEX do the, a similar kind of thing and if so do you use that uh, yes you know exactly what you're gonna shoot um, what the final photo will look at before you take it uh, so there's no guesswork involved the only exception is a, a good exception and that is at night or in low light when you look through the EVF, you're going to see a very noisy image. It's going to look really bad, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, you'll still get a generally good idea of what you're shooting as long as there's some light out there. But it's just going to be really colorful, a lot of color noise and this sort of thing. And you think, oh, no, this is going to be a bad photo. But you'll get over that as soon as you take your first photo and maybe the shutter will be open for a while or something. You know? Of course, in low light, if you're doing a lot of different uh, scenarios, you want to be on a tripod. It will still yeah. look very noisy through the EVF. But then you take the photo, and you look at the final photo, and you'll have no noise. So it's just the live view at night looks quite noisy, uh, but the final photo is good. 
Love it. All right. So let's, you know, there's questions are still streaming in. We could be here for another three hours answering these, but I want to, I want to give, I know you guys have to go. I want to wrap this up. So Trey, you know, parting thoughts. I just had a couple questions here. So there are a ton of people watching this right now and that will watch it in the future, you know, um, and they're going to be making decisions and they're going to be sort of reexamining their, their thought process behind their camera gear choices. So as you're talking to a photographer, say it's an advanced amateur photographer, they don't, they don't make their living with photography, but they saw, I don't know, you know, some famous insert, for famous photographer's name using a D3. So they figured, okay, in order for me to at least be that good, I have to get the gear that that person has. So they go buy their D3, they get Trey's HDR tutorial off stuckincustoms.com and they're off into the races to that person, what would you advise them? You know, if they're if, if they've already purchased a DSLR and spent three or four grand on it, um, should they sell that and go get a smaller camera? If they haven't purchased it yet, should they just go buy a smaller, inexpensive camera? Purchasing advice. Yeah. Well, okay. If they're if they're new into the sport, and I think this is the most exciting time to get into it. By the way, um, and there's a lot. There's millions of people that are just getting into this right now. And they have just recently gone out and gotten a big camera. And maybe they don't really know how to use it yet because it's too much for them. This happens yeah. quite a bit. You know, I understand. Because you think like, oh, I'll get a big camera, they'll learn how to use it. But maybe it's been, you know, three, six months, a year, and you really don't use it the right way or you really don't know what uh, all the cool functionality is. So you don't feel like you're getting, you know, two, three, four, eight thousand dollars $8,000 worth of camera <laughs> out of your purchase. Yeah. Um, well... Uh, I think I would actually advise that you sell it and then buy a couple of smaller cameras because you, then you'll have a ton of extra money left over and I bet you'll be able to produce just as good images as you were, uh, if not better. Um, now, I don't have the same advice if you're a veteran, you know, and you, you, you've been doing this stuff for a long time and you really know how to use your DSLR, I wouldn't advise that you, you sell your situation to get uh, a bunch of smaller cameras. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's, it's actually not a bad choice um, to... Uh, but that's exactly what you did, yeah. though. I mean, you've been using DSLRs for a long time, and you're, you're maybe not selling your Nikon gear, but it's definitely going to gather some more dust than it would have a year ago, right? Yeah, it's definitely what I did. But I know that there are a lot of... Uh, I really like to psychoanalyze uh, people, right? Especially DSLR owners. And I know that there's a sizable crowd that feels threatened by this. Well... You know, I don't, I don't want them to feel threatened by it. I think they should come to it in their own time. I mean, this is a realization that you kind of have to come to um, on your own. And I don't want to, you know, of course, don't, don't listen to me. Who am I? I'm just some guy. But I, I chose to downgrade, right? That's what people right. think. But actually, I think that I've upgraded. And I've ended up with uh, all the benefits um, that I used to have and a bunch more. That's awesome. All right. Parting shots for people that are, you know, sort of, I mean, you answered the question of should you, should you get it? We've beaten into the ground that, you know, these are smaller lenses, that it's lighter. You can get at least as good as professional quality that you were getting with a DSLR. If, you know, you're going to, somebody just sort of came into your periphery and they're like, you know what, I heard you're shooting NEX, Trey. Um, should I shoot NEX too? Because I want to be like, Trey Radcliffe, would you, <laughs> would well, you say yes? Here, I'll, I'll say a couple things there. One, I think it's lovely when people do actually say stuff like this. I can't, I can't believe it. I'm always honored and humbled, and uh, it's very, people say very nice things. But I think when people start getting to, to know me or they come to the website or watch some of the free tutorials or buy the other ones, what they see very quickly, what they very quickly discover is that I don't really teach you how to be like me. I teach you how to be like you. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that as you start going down this, this path of photography and creativity, everyone is quite different. You know, we all have our own personal histories, our own traumas, our own, uh, uh, you know, you just, it's very personal thing that you've gone through your whole life and this feeds into your creativity. So, you know, maybe you'll initially start to create images that look a little bit like mine, but as you get to know these tools, and as I show you different ways to use these tools, you'll actually kind of unlock your own personality and your own creativity, which you're just coming into. So yeah. eventually, your photos won't look like mine. They'll look like 
they're supposed to look. They'll look different. And you'll use some of these tools and techniques to unlock this creative part of yourself that's always been there, but you're just coming to find through your photography. And if you don't have absolutely no idea, you don't care what kind of camera you're going to get, well, maybe you want to get the same one I do. Because in some of my videos, that's actually the camera that I'm using, and it will make a lot of sense to you. Uh, but the camera really doesn't matter. It's uh, a lot of it's in the post processing. And here's here's a larger thing that I'll say say about all that is that uh, something has unexpected has happened in my life since I've brought this into it. And even though I've always felt like I've had an inexhaustible excitement for going out and taking photos, you know, I just never I never get tired of it. I just want to go shoot, you know, every sunset and every sunrise, or if I you know, I want to travel and go go see something and take a photo of it. Yeah, uh, I never have uh, any emptiness in my life as far as that's concerned. I'm constantly excited about it, like a little kid. Um, but since I've added this into my life, it's added an unexpected layer of excitement and happiness, because there was, frankly, as part of all the excitement. You know, you can't have the highs without the lows, right? Mm -hmm. This is. Mm -hmm. Anyone that just says, oh, I'm either average or I'm super happy, there's usually something. People have, you know, we're humans. We have, there's lots of good that comes with the bad. And one yeah. of the bads that used to come with all the excitement was the, the drudgery of dealing with all the weight and all the lenses and packing everything. Because there's the whole, there's, I notice now there's a whole other decision matrix that I go through when going out to take photos. It's like, okay, well, like, which big cameras do I take? What do I put in my main bag? What do I put in my carry bag? Um, you know, maybe there'll be this light situation, so maybe I should take this other giant lens. Do I really want to take that giant lens? You know, and I'm, you know, I'm young or, you know, fit or whatever. I don't really mind carrying all the weight, but you do think like, oh, there's, there's just like a bit of drudgery involved with like all the weight. But now, like all of that's gone. You know, it's all like like the weight of my world, weight of the world is off my shoulders. And now I just grab it and go. I just throw a few lenses in my pocket. It's fun. All the new EVF stuff, even though I do complain about the UI and the software, um, there's still some really cool stuff on here that makes shooting fun. Yeah. So once you get rid of some of the drudgery, this has lightened my load and lightened my attitude and my spirits even more. I love it. Yeah, it's like uh, re-experiencing or, or being reintroduced into photography again, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why, you know, I, I, equipment doesn't matter. And I know people get all excited about equipment. Um, but, uh, that's one thing that I actually like about the equipment conversation is it gets people excited about photography. And as long as people are passionate about what they're doing, um, I think that's awesome. Love it. So to close this off, uh, where the folks that are watching this, you know, most of the folks that are watching this are already familiar with you and stuck in customs um, and where they can find you online. For the folks that aren't, tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, with your website and what was the, why it's there and all that with, with stuck in customs .com. Oh, oh, sure. So yeah, the, the main blog, sort of the center of my digital life is stuck in customs .com, which is now going through a major awesome redesign um, mm. so Curtis Simmons on uh, on our team he's doing something really really cool on the website it's gonna be fantastic because uh, I think actually it's good now but it's a little clunky it feels a little old uh, we just totally uh, redid our store so our store is a really nice experience now and like whatever you buy you can go re-download it later and all kinds yeah. of good stuff so the store has been fully upgraded but the website uh, we're gonna really get this thing going and really slick and then I think in the next uh, six to eight weeks, we have a really exciting announcement that I haven't even told you about, Fred. It's awesome. Hey, I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's really cool. I'll give you, I'll give you a sneak peek. And, uh, but man, I mean, objectively, I know I'm in the middle of it, so it's hard to be objective about it, but it is really cool and quite innovative. We've got a big idea because now luckily we have a ton of extra uh, resources and, we don't we don't do things uh, for the money anymore. We do them for the awesome. Mm -hmm. And there's something out there that that needs to be uh, built. I think that will just help the whole world of photography. And uh, and anyway, we're we're building it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's it's the photographer, the photopreneurs, you know, that are doing that kind of stuff that that I admire. You know, there's there's a handful of people out out there that are kind of doing that sort of 
you know, it leans more towards altruism because you sort of hit this point of, you know, it's not about the money anymore. It's more about helping other photographers do cool things. And that's the stuff that gets me excited. And I love talking about that. So, yeah. So thanks for coming on, Trey. I, I appreciate it. And thanks for letting me use your channel to record an interview with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, of course. And thanks uh, everyone for that, uh, watched and asked all these live questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Uh, yeah, but... they're they're still coming in. I have a feeling you're going to be up for the next three or four days answering these somehow. But there's a there's a ton of great questions in there, and I apologize to all the folks. Hey, and sorry, Brent, I asked the wrong question that you uh, that you submitted, but uh, you know, but it's all good. We got lots of good <laughs> questions in there. I think we accomplished the goal of this interview was which was to demystify your move from the big giant DSLRs, Nikon specifically, into the smaller, more svelte Sony line of NEX, and specifically the NEX7 and the addition of the NEX6 that you just stuck into your kit bag as well, right? Yes, that's right. Well, thanks uh, thanks so much for all the good questions and everything. I hope, I hope it has been demystified and people understand um, understand everything better now. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Well, now the decision is yours, listeners. You can uh, either continue on the DSLR uh, train or experiment with these smaller cameras. You know, these are fun to play with, I got to tell you. So thanks, Trey. All right, dude. See you later. Thanks, everybody. See ya.